Hello, uh, good evening. We'll begin with disbursements of some 600 million CD stimulus packet for SMEs this week. Now, that's according to the Executive Director of the National Board for Small Scale Industries, Kosi Yankee. Now, what do you make of this news and what are the expectations with regards to how much, uh, you know, like to, uh, the SMEs are supposed to get? Also, uh, the uh, oil marketing companies have increased fuel prices and other petroleum products at the ports. Uh, pump, the pumps of uh, the uh, fuel stations also by uh, imagine that you know some people did not expect we'll be getting into that later on as we go on, on the show but just so you know this is the third increase over the last um, almost six to seven weeks now and that's raising concerns as to what the impact of the consumer uh, will be going forward if these increases in fuel prices continues. We're going to be talking about that. Welcome to the Authoritative Business Analysis Program, uh, Business Focus here on TV3. I am Alfred Okansi. I want you to send us uh, your views ahead as we discuss this particular issue as well, with issues with the fuel prices going up and then also uh, the NBSSI indicating that disbursement of the funds to qualified SMEs will begin this week but before we get into the conversation as always let's start with some of the stories that made headlines over the last few days take a look Oh, there's more news on 3news.com. This is Business Focus. As always, we're live on TV3 Ghana on Facebook, DSTV channel 279, all across the world on 3news.com and keep your thoughts coming through. But let's start off with this. Executive Director of the National Board for Small Scale Industries, Kosi Yankee, has announced that SMEs who have gone through the process of verification of their detail will receive their share of the 600 million city stimulus package from government beginning this week. Now, she was reacting to concerns raised by the National Association of Private Schools on the delay in releasing the funds. Uh, she assured that the board is working on ensuring that the process is as transparent as possible. She spoke to my colleague, Etanam Se, earlier on, on TV3. Take a look at this. Ghana National Association of Private Schools alone, we are over 30,000. Okay. We are over 30,000. And um, I would say about 60, 70% have applied for the loan. Okay. Yes. So um, we are looking forward for a very positive response. What was the picture like? You've been home for four months. Just give us a brief of what you've been going through. Yes. Um, it has been a very challenging moment. It has not been that easy. We're all not expecting anything like lockdown or closure of schools. Mm -hmm. But um, the situation demanded that we close down uh, schools. And when the president came out uh, with the announcement, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. by then we were coming back from midterms. And that was the time that our parents used to pay school fees. And with private schools, our strength depends on the school fees. And since we're not able to collect our school fees, we're also not able to pay our teachers. So the teachers have been in the house all this while. Mm -hmm. And um, yes, we have, we have challenges, but the major one for now is the uh, resumption of schools. Mm -hmm. Now that school is going to resume, when you come to the private schools, we do uh, subject teaching mm -hmm. and 
uh, here, are, here is the case, we have not paid our teachers and they are coming back, we are asking them to come back again to handle the kids, mm -hmm. uh, which is not that easy because uh, we've not paid them and um, some of the teachers are also coming from far. Okay. They will have to pay transportation to school. So it means it will be difficult for you to sustain them in the school around times like these because you don't have the funds. Yes, it's going to be difficult. Okay. Um, but, but, but you've applied to the MBSSI to have access to the 600 million cities. You're saying some 60 to 70 percent of your members have applied. Yes, I wanted to say that, um, you know, when you come okay. to some of our classes... Okay, so, so let me speak to the executive uh, director of the National Board for Small Scale Industries, Madam Kusi Yankee. Good morning, Madam. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, I trust you well. Very well, thank you. Right. So I, I just want to ask whether you've received any uh, requests from private schools uh, regards access to the 600 million in the stimulus uh, package. Oh, yes. I mean, we have received um, some requests from uh, the private education sector, other sectors as well. Mm -hmm. And I think we are also, we have an association group who is um, their association as well. And we engage with them quite regularly. So what's the status of their request? It does appear that it's taking a bit of time for them to access these funds. Is that what they are saying or you are saying? That's what he's saying. He's saying it's taking time. Yes. They are hoping that the process will be faster than it is take, it's taking a while because the schools are resuming for GHS and, and they are asking themselves that if teachers are going to be coming to school and school fees have not been paid, how are we going to manage them? How are we going to pay them? And so that's really a concern for them. Yes, they, um, I think that they ask for an extension. It's one of the associations ask for an extension in even the um, registration and application process. So I, okay. I'm, I'm a bit confused from your question. Okay, so how long will it take for, for them to access these funds so that when I apply for, uh, uh, for a loan for uh, part of the 600 million cities, how long will it take me for me to get, get uh, the funds, access the funds? As I mentioned to you, some of the associations wrote to extend the application process. Okay. So I don't, um, I don't know if it aligns with your question, but what had been asked by some of the association members, and some of them were one of the, I don't know which of the private schools association you are speaking with today, but some of them Ghana National Association of Private Schools. For, Ghana National Association of Private Schools. Um, the application process. Okay. Because you say, they felt their members had not been able to fully um, apply for it. So I, I'm trying to um, figure out where the question is also coming. So, so this association is saying Ghana National Association of Private Schools, and he mentions that some 60 to 70 percent of their members have applied for this stimulus package. Um, yes, so as I mentioned to you, some of them have asked for an extension. Okay. Some of the private schools association have asked us to extend the date so they can finish putting in the application. And if I look at my data, it's the education and the tourism that have the least number of people who have actually applied. Okay. Okay. So, so what does it mean for teachers who are asking uh, right now that uh, they, they are about to resume school, GHS is starting today, and they are wondering how do we keep afloat? What do you have to tell them? Um, as I mentioned to you the last time, the stimulus package is really to support the private schools and what the private schools intend to do with it based on the challenges they face during the COVID-19 pandemic. Mm -hmm. So as much as possible, that is also very dear to our hearts. Mm -hmm. So as soon as we release it to the private schools, I guess that if the school, because every school has what their need is, mm -hmm. some want to look at teachers, some want to look at other things that they have. Mm -hmm. So once it goes to the education and the education where the educational institutions want to use it for that purpose, then it would work best for them. So apart from those who have asked for an extension, like you're saying, when do we hope to release funds to some of these private schools? Do we have timelines? Oh, we lost uh, Madam Kosi uh, Yankee.
Well, so there you have it. Um, according to the NBSSI boss, uh, uh, Madame Kosi Yankee, the, the, the disbursement will begin, all things being equal, this week. And we have eyes on this. We're going to be updating you. We have direct correspondence from the National Board for Small Scale Industries on this particular issue. Still stay with us here on Business Focus. But the Court of Appeal on Monday, June 22, 2020, dismissed an appeal by the Bank of Ghana, which challenged the jurisdiction of the High Court in hearing the suit filed by GN Savings and Loans over the revocation of its license. Now, the Bank of Ghana had argued that the High Court has no jurisdiction to hear the complaint challenging the revocation of GN Savings and Loans uh, license. It argued that the only lawful forum for resolving the GN Savings and Loans concerns is the Ghana Arbitration Center. However, the High Court dismissed its application in December 2019, thereby compelling the Bank of Ghana to seek redress at the Court of Appeal. And uh, ruling on the Bank of Ghana's appeal today, uh, the Court of Appeal unanimously dismissed uh, the application and directed the Bank of Ghana to go back to the High Court and justify the revocation of the license of GN Savings. Now, the lawyer for GN Savings, Justice Shemsai, expressed concern about Bank of Ghana's legal gymnastics. That's how he put it, uh, which he said, are uh, all aimed at stalling the case and thereby perverting the course of justice. The court was presided over by Justice uh, Akayensu with Justices El Elmensa and Anthony Pong there. So in October, if you recall, in October 2019, the Bank of Ghana and the Attorney General raised a preliminary legal objection to the case brought by Dr. Papakosi Indum and two other shareholders of GN Savings and Loans Limited. Now, in the objection, the Bank of Ghana and the Attorney General argued that the High Court has no jurisdiction to hear the case complaint, which is challenging the revocation of GN Savings. So that's what you have there um, uh, with what's happened in court today. We have eyes on this as well and be updating you on this particular one. So live here on Business Focus here on TV3. But right after this quick break, we're going to stay with issues relating to the savings and loans and the microfinance institutions that lost their licenses as a result of the revocation exercised by the Bank of Ghana sometime last year. So uh, Solomon Donko is a chairman for the Coalition for the Microfinance Institutions and Savings and Loans Companies, ex-workers. They have some concerns. Uh, we're going to get into it right after this. Do stay with us here on Business Focus. Welcome back to Business Focus here on TV3. We're live on TV3 Ghana on Facebook, DSTV Channel 279, all across the world on 3news.com. Now, former staff of the collapsed microfinance and savings and loans companies are appealing to government to expedite action on the payment of their severance packages. Now, the staff insist their living conditions have worsened by the hardship occasioned by the COVID-19 pandemic. The ex-staff, in a statement which we have a copy of, called on all stakeholders working on their packages to be sensitive to the time and fast track the process. I've been joined via Zoom by Mr. Solomon Donko, who is a chairman for the coalition of the ex-workers of microfinance institutions and savings and loans companies uh, that were collapsed by the Bank of Ghana after their licenses were withdrawn. Mr. Donko, good evening. Thank you very much for your time this evening. Good evening to Great. you. Good evening to you. First off, first off, uh, you, you have been engaging um, with the receiver and others about your situation. What have they been telling you? Well, thank you. Uh, what they've been telling us is that they are still in the process of working on our exit package um, since our licenses were revoked. But as of now, uh, we have not gotten, or the process has not completed. That's why we are appealing to all the stakeholders involved to fast track it for us to leave our members. I see. Where are they with the process that you want it to be fast tracked? According to the receiver, Mr. Rekna Nanipa, uh, he says he has finished all that he needs to do and has forwarded it to the Bank of Ghana. But 
it's been some time now and um, that is the information that we have i see so in this case uh what you're saying is that the delay is on the part of the bank of ghana according to the receiver what is telling you we cannot say the delay is coming from the bog because we don't know when the receiver also you know finish his work and uh, forwarded it to the bog but that's the information that we have the last information that we have from the receiver that it is with the bank of ghana i see so, so don't know whether the delay is from the bank of ghana or from the receiver that did not work on it quickly but with your engagement with the with the receiver, Eric Nanipa, what kind of severance package are we talking about here for your members? Well, you know, we were engaged with this um, 23 savings and loans companies and finance houses that were, uh, their licenses were revoked in August, and then the microfinance, their, um, their employment were also terminated in May. So as ex-staff, we are calling on the government for our exit package, you know, to be processed quickly for us. Because as a staff, we are entitled to uh, an exit package once our employment has been terminated. Because immediately our licenses were revoked, what followed was a revocation of our employment by the receiver. Mm. How many are you, uh, this, this group that you, you are the chairman of? We have a total beneficiary of almost 5,000. 5,000? 5, yes, made up of ex-staff of the savings and loans companies, the finance houses, and then the microfinance institutions. Directly, we are about 5,000. But you know, in Ghana, the dependency uh, one percent, the, the dependency on you is about five or three, uh, six. So mm. a lot of you know livelihoods have been affected because of this. Certainly, and and I'll put it this way to put a human feeling to it. So you have five thousand families um, who who have been impacted as a result of this situation, right? So, but I mean to to just finalize this. What's the situation, um, your members? Give us a typical situation, because in the statement you say that they, they are suffering because of COVID-19. In fact, the COVID has aggravated the suffering that you find yourself in. Give us a typical example of any of your members, what you're going through right now. Good. Um, it's been almost a year. In the case of the microfinance institutions, the lances were revoked in May, and then uh, for the savings and loans and the uh, uh, finance houses, our licenses were revoked in August. So from that time up to now, immediately the receiver took over our employment with our, you know, the uh, collapsed institutions were revoked. So we have not been in employment since then. And from that time, almost a year now, you know, it's also difficult for members to get engaged back into the former sector. And then we all know this year what, um, because of the COVID, most institutions are also suffering. So to even get employment in any of these institutions is also difficult. Maybe you may have one of the businesses that you are doing, but because of COVID, the business has also you know, been affected. So we have a lot of our members, you cannot pay your bills, your your children bills, you know, your medical bills, and the psychological you know, trauma that you go through, even after COVID, things are very difficult. I see. So we are just appealing to the president through the finance minister, the Bank of Ghana governor, the receiver, whoever is in, involved in the processing of our exit package to uh, expedite action on it so that our members can have some relief. Mr. Donko, I, I would want to thank you very much. But while we end, is that to say that all the 5,000 of you none have gained employment in other companies after your companies were shut or closed down? No, we cannot say that. Uh, probably or possibly uh, some few ones have been engaged. But the majority 
uh, still at home. Right. Mr. Solomondoko, thank you uh, for your time this evening. We're grateful that you've made the time to speak with us. Uh, Solomondoko is the chairman of the coalition of ex-staff of these microfinance and savings and loans companies whose licenses were withdrawn uh, by the Bank of Ghana sometime last year, if you recall. And they say the number is about 5,000. We're going to keep an eye on this. And they are talking about the receiver, Eric Lanepa, saying that the delay is coming from the Bank of Ghana. That's according to them. We'll, we'll follow up and get some answers. But fuel prices have gone up in the second pricing window in the month of June 2020, as analysts predicted. It has been observed that a lot of consumers are not even paying attention to the fuel prices at the pumps. But guess what? It's been increasing over the last two weeks. This is the second increase in fuel prices within two weeks. My colleague, Joseph Armstrong Gold, visited some fuel stations, interacted with some consumers. Take a look at this. Fuel prices have gone up at the various filling stations. But do drivers know that fuel prices have gone up? Let's find out. I should have done that, but I didn't check. Mm. And I think about three or four weeks ago, I was told that the price has gone down. Mm. But if they've increased, I don't know. Uh, passing yes, and it's what it. So, and I feel and so I'm asking how to. Oh, only I can. I'm going to fall in. Oh, if I don't have enough money, I'm going to go to the dealer. If I don't go to the dealer, I'm going to pay. 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 I'm going to the increment of fuel prices is affecting their work and they want government to adjust fuel prices to enable them to make some good sales. Joseph Armstrong Gold, Alibi, TV3, Accra. Well, that's uh, my colleague Joseph Armstrong. He likes to be called Gold, so I add that to it. Joseph Armstrong Gold, Alibi, there, uh, giving us the details of the fuel price increase. Duncan Amor is the executive director of the Chamber of Petroleum Consumers, COPEC. Uh, he speaks for the consumers whom my colleague spoke to. He's joining me in the studio. Duncan, it's good to have you uh, And uh, as we get into it and let's all observe the whole process of ensuring that we uh, are safe in this. Thank you so much for joining us in the studio this evening and to get an analysis of exactly what we are confronted with right now. First off, this is the second increase in the last two weeks, the first was 8.3% rise. And this one, we're talking about 4.25. Is, is the, are these increases justified? We're talking about almost 13% increase over the last two weeks. Alfred, good evening. It's actually scary, to say the least. Uh, it was expected that prices will go up. But if you just oppose with when we saw reductions or when... Ghanaians were supposed to get reductions. They came in piecemeal. Uh, you wake up is 2% reduction, 1.5, 2%, 3%. Uh, hmm. Unfortunately, when is the reverse, when it has to go up, uh, within a fortnight or two week uh, period, you are seeing almost 12, 13% increases. Mm -hmm. That for us is quite scary from 4.5 zero there about somewhere even at 3.75 exactly uh, as we speak everybody is rising to the 4.65 six there about um, 4.7 if you do the numbers for those who want to buy them in gallons or want to think of them in gallon terms what it means between june 1st and now is that you are going to pay about two three cities more per gallon so for hmm. the trot drivers they usually get hardest hits and the long distance big buses and those who operate transport uh, commercially mm. they get hardest hits because if you use a trotter that consumes say 10 gallons a day absolutely three cities it means that you are going to spend about and, 30 and, cities and the, more <laughs> transport fares haven't gone up they haven't gone up so clearly it's it's going to take a, a, a huge toll on them and alfred the sad aspect because of COVID they cannot also pick to capacity. Mm -hmm. So there are spaces in there because we need to ensure social distancing. Within the same period, fuel prices are going up for them. For, for some of them, between June 1st and now, 
they would have to augment uh, their fuel consumption numbers by 30 cities daily. If 30 you do, cities if you do on a daily the, basis? If you do the numbers by even 20 days, that's about 600 Ghana cities that we've slapped on them. We do think that the same way prices, when they have to go down, uh, we stagger and release them piecemeal. Mm -hmm. uh, we do think that increases should also come piecemeal because oftentimes you wake up and the difference is so huge. Um, you wonder if we couldn't have done 10 pesos or 7 pesos, 11, 13 pesos, but you wake up if it's not 30, 40 pesos, 20. But, I mean, 13% in two weeks, how, what could have contributed to this? Um, that we're saying. I mean, we need to understand the language of the OMCs as well. Um, what, why? Alfred, you do get to talk to, in fact, the majors, the bigger ones mm -hmm. and the other key players. Uh, as per our understanding, fuel prices are driven by three key um, reflectors or indicators. You talk about the international market price external. Mm -hmm. Then you talk about your CD dollar relationship internal. Then you talk about your taxes. Yes. How much government wants from the commodity. Mm -hmm. So you look at these three. There are two of the three that we have control totally. Okay. There's so the one first, we don't have any control the over. The international market price. Uh, you don't have any control crude, over. Yes. We don't have control. Yes. But they are the, geopolitically determined. Okay. You can't control them. The CD dollar relationship. relationship and the impact that it has on this. How do we control that? Let's start with that. You see, Alfred, we have said, in fact, this morning, uh, we we're actually putting a document together for the Bank of Ghana. Mm -hmm. Not long ago, you used to hear about auctioning of dollars and all of that. We are saying that your petroleum imports are as essential as anything you would want to wait on. Because if fuel prices go up, it affects, I mean, even a ball of kinky. Yes. It affects everything. And so treat your petroleum imports as essential and give them quarterly rates so that if the importer knows that per this quarter, the dollar is pegged at 5.6 for me, mm -hmm. I can get to pay 5.6 to be able to pay my supplier a million dollars. And this is how much cities I would need. They would not need to do forward forecast figures, inputs into the pricing. So you can cut off the CD dollar pressure on your pump prices if and only if you are managing uh, these importers mm -hmm. right and what they would need to be able to pay their suppliers <laughs> let me explain please alfred if i'm going to buy uh, oil mm -hmm. be it crude or the finished products yeah uh, petrol diesel i cannot go with my cd and say this is cd so take i'll have to go with dollar mm -hmm. now if i go buy with dollar I cannot come to Ghana and say I'm going to sell in dollar because there's only one legal tender, the city. Yes. So I need to do a conversion. Mm -hmm. So let's say that I went to get $1 million worth of products, mm -hmm. right? Let's say 1 million liters is what I got for $1 million. Right. Now, a liter for me in the city, I would have needed two weeks ago about 5.5 million cities to pay off my $1 million. Now, because the city is not stable, by the time I finish and have to pay the supplier, I need 5.7. Because of the city, the city has, you know, depreciated. Depreciating. So I would need to change more cities to be able to pay the supplier. That 200,000 overrun, I would need to factor it into my pricing so that I don't finish selling and get 5.5 and I need to go and borrow or sell an asset or something to be able to pay the additional 200,000. So they factor all of that in. That is what they call forward forecasts, mm. right? You can delink or decouple that forward forecast only and if only the Bank of Ghana will be able to secure these petroleum importers. Some dollar, I mean, rates. That says that per this quarter, first quarter, your dollar, whatever, it's will be pegged. Is pegged at this. Then but they don't need, need to, I so mean... So they, they are sure that from the um, volatile... Volatility uh, of the city, whether it goes down or it comes or up, dollar. it won't have an impact. But this is not the first time you are making this argument. What has always been the response of the Bank of Ghana to this? You see, I've heard you say this before. <laughs> Alfred, they do know these things. And sometimes you wonder why they wouldn't want to do them. Probably it will come at a cost to them. But there have been times that the city has also performed strongly. 
So assuming that you peg it at 5.6, right, it's more like hedging. What it means is that if the city performs better, the Bank of Ghana will gain. If, mm -hmm. it, if it depreciated to say 5.8, it means that there will be no pressure on the importer because he's been assured of 5.6 and he doesn't need to factor 5.8 mm -hmm. in his pricing. So either way you look at it, you'll be able to uh, protect the consumer from those harsh ravages of the city's depreciation. Right. Unfortunately, maybe because of the numbers and what it means to Bank of Ghana's uh, bottom, they will mm. prefer to just leave it and people should go and source for the dollar. But once they are chasing the dollar, our fear again is that because COVID is also uh, declining gradually globally, mm -hmm. demand is shooting up. Economists are getting back to where they were. Yes. And so demand for oil will go up. India, China... And other economists that Certainly. take it hugely. Because just like any other commodity with gold, salt, uh, price of crude is basically determined by demand and supply, which as, are largely as influenced by simple as that. speculators, politicians, and all as of that. You and, know? And but I, I want to look at this. I'm sorry you, you, to, to interrupt you, but the other bit on the taxes, unless you want to conclude on the point that you were making. Then In, indeed, quickly, I'll just mm -hmm. conclude on what What we are saying is that they link the CD dollar from pawn prices. The mm -hmm. truck truck driver may not even see a dollar all his life, mm -hmm. but he is paying for the dollar or the city's depreciation at the pumps. It's sad. We could do something about it for them. Could do something about it for everybody, but we are not. Wow. And they are paying for it. When the city depreciates, the three factors. Mm -hmm. If the city alone depreciates, an international market price does not even go up. Then you will pay more. This. Let me look at this. How about the taxes? I mean, because you, you have been asking at the special petroleum tax, others, um, th there were promises to have it taken off uh, by this particular administration prior to their coming to office. It was reduced. Um, and, and, and now, here's where we are. W what have they been telling you? What's the <laughs> reason for keeping these tax elements in the books, which is compounding the income? prices that we are paying at the pumps. Alfred, well, I do think that policy makers, uh, decision makers, politicians mm -hmm. and authorities have been quite, quite unfair to Ghanaians. At the time when crude prices tumble or they drop, they decline, mm -hmm. you will find all kinds of shenanigans. They input taxes. The excuse is that because we are an oil producing country, mm -hmm. so when crude prices are lower, it affects revenue for the government, the central government. So if you recall in 2015, December 22nd, mm -hmm. a bill goes to parliament asking for special petroleum tax. Yeah. We call that ESLA, in mm -hmm. the ESLA. And then you slap a tax on, on, on finished products because your crude exports were not giving you the kind of revenues that you wanted. Mm -hmm. The excuse was that, oh, crude prices are down. So when it goes up, we can remove it. That's what they tell Ghanaians. And unfortunately, when crude prices now get back from the 30s to 40 to 50, even then to 60 and sometimes 70, that they could have taken it off because they will be getting more from their crude exports. They get it, I mean, retained as a permanent fixture. So you have a lot of the taxes that had census clauses. That means that they should have been taking off a year or two or three ago, mm -hmm. but they are still on there. Some have also been increased. And unfortunately, Alfred, the more these taxes continue to bite, uh, the more world market prices continue to go right. up, the more your city continues to depreciate, the more you are charging the trotro and taxi driver. We are saying manage for prices in Ghana and don't just leave it. There's a paper you're preparing on this, so I'm going to wait on that. But I want to thank you for coming to Duncan. And we are going to follow this up um, because we all pay for whatever happens at the pumps. Mm -hmm. Duncan Amwa, Executive Director of the Chamber of Petroleum Consumers Corporate, joining us in the studio. We'll be back shortly. Right after this break, we're celebrating our move up for today. Very interesting one. Do stay with us. Well, tonight on the Mover segment, we share with you the story of Pearl Yaya Dodo, who, after restrategizing her business plan amid the COVID-19 pandemic, is staying viable in business. Petals and syrup is just seven months old and is already cutting a niche in the beverage industry.
Take a look at this. Hello, Ghana. Uh, the location is Taifa, and the mission is so simple. We are here to engage a startup business, Petals and Syrup, and the brain behind that is Pearl Yaira Doji. We want to know how it all started, how the business started, and how she's even coping in this COVID-19 period. Let's do this. Let's get the story and share it to you. Hello, Pearl. Hi, Joy. What's up? <laughs> Everyone my nose and my challenge. Please do. Very important. <laughs> Hello. Good to have you. Good to have you. Mm. Petals and Syrup originally started as a mini bar for events including weddings, engagement, birthdays, among others. A ban on social gathering as a safety measure by government had a toll on the business, but business-oriented Pearl Yaira Dodu we strategize to stay viable. People are excited. Initially, it was a little difficult, even getting people to taste it. But now, people are very much excited about it. And it's working. I personally call people back for feedbacks. I don't wait till you call me. I call you, so maybe I give it to you. I didn't hear anything from you in a day. The following day, I'll call you, oh, how is it? Is there anything you think I should add? Is there anything you think I should take out? Is there anything you are allergic to? So it exposes me, lets me know, okay, so maybe there are some people that are allergic to honey. So now I know if I'm making this for you, I can't add honey, so we have to find a substitute. I love feedbacks. I'll call you if you don't call me. She decided to do juice pouches for her product, and that is really selling for her. I use this five. I call it please. So the first, the P is please. The second one is listen, okay. The third is explain. The A, the E is explain. The A is apologize. And then the S is service, okay. And then the last E is to express gratitude. So these are the things I actually work with. Okay, so whether the customer just wants to rant, they are right, it's because of them I am here. So anything to make them happy, even if they say anything against me, the individual, I, I, I sometimes will just laugh it off and then get into my room and I'm upset, but then with the person personally, no. Yeah. You know what I was thinking? I thought you would be your, your flavor in, it. mm -hmm. like, like, in bottles, like. No. That was thinking. No. Yeah, so that is, I blended some pineapples mm. and all of that. So I do everything from scratch. Oh, I see. Yes. I do everything from scratch, so it's so I don't even add preservatives. Yeah, that, that. Yes, I don't add preservatives. Yeah, a lot. It takes limited time to, you know, expire. Yes. So like when it gets to the beginning, like let's say a week. A should, week. Yeah, you should finish it. But if you want it to stay, then I would advise that you put it in a freezer. The government is giving us some time, you know, to cover it, you know. So I heard. So maybe you can, you know, try and for it. And get some. Is it even real? It's real, come on. <laughs> you benefit from it because you've been impacted one or the other. Yeah, well, yeah. So you can get at least from 20,000 be there. Hey! <laughs> to support you. To support me. I see. Yes. And where do you get the discount? Um, our market here. I just buy it on the market and then. Oh, you're making. I'm trying to help you. <laughs> wow. Yes. So, but there's some you know when they finish they dry and use it again. They use it again. Yeah, there's some people who do that. Okay. There's some people who do that. But if you do that, you won't get the way like you won't get the consistency. Mm. It would actually be light or something. Thank you. Yeah. Her sobolo comes in flavors including mint, strawberry, cinnamon, grape, and pineapple. Currently, Pell has employed two people who are helping with the business, and that includes a delivery person. Social media, she admits, is a game changer for every business, so she never takes it lightly at all. She craved to see Petals and Syrup as a household name in ensuing years. Her advice to potential entrepreneurs is that they should be prayerful and hardworking and not rely on people to get things done. Okay, so this is how the pouch looks like, and it's a Ziploc. So the good thing about this is if you are not done, you can always zip back mm -hmm. and then hold it. It's very handy as well. 
and if you are done and you still want to since we are doing a lot of recycling these days you can pour water into it put it in your freezer for mm, ice I see. you can dry it and then put maybe oat or mm. tom brown or something into it do you measure the yes quantity? i know what goes in here so I'm, i made sure that Okay. This line tells me that this is the end because it is more than this. There'll be too much pressure on the pouch, so it'll, it'll seep. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Let me just leave you to Wow, guys, to it. You, Charlie, we all know this is one correct packaging. <laughs> Obviously, would also aid into, you know, a customer being convinced to buy this very package from exactly. Petals and Serum. But, you know, we can also attest to the fact that COVID-19 came with a lot of negatives. But there are some positive. People are seeing the positive in it because, you know, Petals and Serum was like a mini bar for occasions and events. But she had to, you know, re-strategize and he's so cash in during this critical you know period and i think she's doing so great and i'm sure you've learned some few things from her while she was sharing her story so you can also you know see the glory in the pandemic and make something out of it cash in as well and this is the story brought to you petals and syrup we came to you from taifa and keep watching tv3 my name is josh queen and uh, yaira has been my guest thanks for watching have a good evening Oh boy, George has the best part of the show anyway. But uh, that's pearl of petals and syrup out there to do some great things. And we celebrate you, pearl, and we certainly wish you all the best. And we know that the startup of today is the big business of tomorrow. That's why we do this every other Monday with a movement segment with George steering uh, the wheel right there. And uh, on that note, that very encouraging note, I want to say thank you as always for staying with us here on Business Focus. My name is Alfred Okonsi. On behalf of the rest of the team, Mr. Domsey, George Quening, Kia Mensah, Brampa, all the business team here, thank you so much for the support. I am Alfred Okonsi. Stay with us. There's more coming up. Good evening. <laughs>